Greetings, great people, or oh, great Abyssinian people. Today, we are going to make a very serious declaration about a very disturbing charge. The declaration is, Africans did not sell you out. We did not sell our people at any time to anybody, and there is no evidence to support such an ignorant and devious conclusion. These are devastating charges. Charges that's preventing the African continent from moving forward. Charges that continuously surface just in time to nurture distrust, suspicion, and a feeling of worthlessness among our people all over the world. Now, let us examine this. From we born, we hear that Africans sold us out. As a matter of fact, some people say we began hearing this misinformation while we were still in the womb. Later, we heard it from our parents, our elders, our teachers. It was the general understanding of the society. However, however, when one stop and analyze the situation, one must conclude that yes, we were involved, but only as victims. So, let us shed some light on this matter so as to free our ancestors from this disgraceful and dishonorable charge. We must make it clear that there was never a market for buying and selling people in Africa before the arrival of Caucasian terrorists from Europe. Let's make that clear. There was never a market. Now, the first charge the Caucasian wants to lay on us and lay on our generations is conspiracy. And yes, it is the Caucasian who told us about our involvement. Without naming names, he said that before he came, a number of us got together, kidnapped and sold each other. To whom and to where, he did not say. Outside of his say-so, he has produced nothing to support his claim. Buying and selling is capitalism, and capitalism never existed in Abyssinia before the arrival of Caucasian man. So we know right from the start he's lying. The second charge is raiding our villages and kidnapping our people. That's another charge that the Caucasians wants to lay on us. That's another low-grade charge, and it's believed by our people across a very wide spectrum. It ranges from those who barely went to school to those leaving university with the highest qualifications. Now, how did these two diverse groups come to agree at the same historic conclusion when they never met academically? Who thought both of them? We in Africa knew that Caucasian man was a merciless killer whose brutality was felt by people, plants and animals. He was selling us as workers in the copper mines of North Africa, but primarily as fighters for his arenas in Greece and Rome to kill and be killed long before Christopher Columbus was born. So, for some Africans, those who were bred and designed in the West, to mimic the Caucasian, saying, we sold you out. That is just plain insulting to our peaceful ancestors. That type of thinking can only be classified as clouded, to say the least. We never kidnapped our people and sold them to the invader at any time. We were never paid to catch our people either. They did that sinful job themselves, and none of us was safe. It was Caucasian historians who started this lie and placed it in their books. Those books they gave to us after our so-called independence in the West, including the Caribbean. By this time, they realized the legal implications and decided to blame us for helping him to enslave us. It's like the stick-up man who sticks you up, takes you to the bank, threatens to kill you unless you give him your PIN number. The thief then takes out your money, spends it, gets caught, and say he is only 50% responsible because you gave him the pin number. What madness. In the meantime, him have a gun to your head. Books were specifically written for Africa, and that's why it was so easy for Abyssinians to disgracefully discard the names of their ancestors and accept a Western name and a Western lifestyle. 
They are even taking a Western God. All of this while they still live on the continent of those same ancestors. So how far can one be mentally removed from oneself while still living at home? How far? Our organized enslavement started approximately 2,000 years ago with Julius Caesar. As a matter of fact, some say it started before that. However, however, at this time, we need not go back any further than 2,000 years to get a grip on this matter. It is too embarrassing to publicly admit that somebody had you as a servant in your own house for 2,000 years. As if God made them smarter than you. As if they have two heads and you only have one. As if they have three hands and you only have one. So here we are today with Caucasian man. He wants to hold us partially responsible for the destruction of our family and our culture. But don't believe him. It must be understood that it was Caucasians alone who is responsible for our enslavement. And there is lots of evidence everywhere, everywhere, especially in every European country, to prove they are the only ones who benefited. Their refrigerators are filled with our food and their freezers contain millions of seeds from our homeland. They have thousands of jars filled with genetic specimen and DNA material in all areas of biology, zoology, and botany. Their zoos overflow with animals taken from our continent that they breed generationally just like they did to us. Their museums display thousands and thousands of our relics and artifacts with thousands and thousands more hidden away under the Vatican in Rome in the bowels of Buckingham Palace, in the cellars of King Leopold's castle in Belgium, and many, many more places. Their vaults are filled with our gold, and their necklaces loaded with our diamonds and pearls. In the meantime, their cities are organized and sanitized from our ideas and our inventions. In schools outside of Africa, his books deliberately mislead us into believing that the transfer of Africans to the Americas and the Caribbean was the first time they forcibly removed Africans from Africa, and that is a big lie. The story was designed not only to fool teachers, elders, and even some who should know better, it was designed to negatively affect our DNA to include treachery as one of the cells in our bodies so as to permanently prevent our unification. That would allow them, that would allow them to continue robbing our continent. It was devised to have a negative and irrevocable claim made against our very being, sending a strong message of self-hate deep into our generations. Now, what is the usual acceptable prerequisite or the usual acceptable criteria measuring the qualification of those who teach us? It is usually based on how long they were themselves were taught by the Caucasian. But how could they take the word of someone who has a vested interest in the matter? It is because they were not thinking about the matter independently. They were trained to accept and consume, not to think. Especially think about things that the Caucasians tell them. Caucasians tell them not to question the Bible, just accept it. And many of them do. Many of us do. We never question the Bible. So, Caucasian man says we are guilty of selling our people to him. And when you ask him for proof, just believe him, he says. Just take his word. But how can we do this when we have his resume that shows historically he's a liar, a thief, and a mercenary? When you ask members of your own community who publicly repeat this story, when you ask them for proof, for evidence 
to support what they say, what they repeat, they tell you to do the research. They say the information is out there. Out where? What they fail to understand is that the source of the information they present as fact is none other than the same Caucasian who enslaved us. See whose names appear as the writer, the publisher and distributor of those research manuals. All of them are European names. Since the story is from him and him alone, how can we close the case? His story represents only one of the two parties involved. So what about the story from the other party? Where is our story? Where? Or maybe some of you think it is not necessary to hear from us. So when did we authorize Caucasians to speak on our behalf? When? We hear the story about the lion and the hunter. The hunter says the lion whose head now lies stuffed above his fireplace was a savage beast. Is that true? Have we heard the lion's side of the story? No. Why not? Because he's dead. He was killed by the guy telling the story and dead lions tell no tale. What would be the testimony of Trayvon Martin if he had the opportunity to do so? Would it be the same as George Zimmerman? Here again, some of us might be domesticated enough to think that his testimony was not really necessary. That since Zimmerman was there, they would accept his account of what took place. So, for those black intellectuals who agree, with a one-sided report written and authorized by European historians, we can only conclude without apology that at this time, at this time, their intelligence level is most disgraceful. There are influential people, people like Ronoko Rashidi, Mustafa Ansari, Louis Farrakhan, etc., who surprisingly repeat this foolishness over and over again. They believe it. But what is worse is that they want us to believe it as well. Now, if the victimizer himself couldn't convince us, we should not allow those in his buffer zone, those who he allowed to run loose on his plantation, to do so. You think they would know that by teaching this foolishness they are helping Caucasians spread the word to our people and to the world that historically we are an untrustworthy kind of human being. What madness! How can these men teach and project this low-down racial image of us and themselves in such graceful arrogance is beyond me. The only time the victim agrees with the victimizer is when the victim is afraid. But when the victim becomes free, they are not afraid anymore. Obviously, these men are still afraid, even dangerous, but not to those who abuse and enslave us, but they are dangerous. They have no right to denigrate our ancestors like this in public based on the words of known terrorists who murdered our ancestors and stole our homeland. They have no right to do this. Regardless of any so-called contribution they may make to our society, if they also deliver information that makes it impossible for us to unite and form our own nation, then what good are they to us? They are simply incorporating us into white society since African unity would be impossible based on the core of what they teach. Imagine the enslaved agreeing with his enslaver that he enslaved himself. What madness! It is not normal for the enslaved to agree with the enslaver on anything at any time. Especially, especially something that reduces the guilt of the enslaver. Only an enslaved person who was not in his right mind would do that. And these eminent men and many others are projected to the world as our leaders. They are the ones white folks tolerate because they allow and cater to revolutionaries to blow off steam. To release pent up frustration verbally. 
and who subsequently are identified for arrest or execution by the enslaver. These men, they talk about our development. They talk about the atrocities committed on us. But at the same time, they are helping Caucasians saddle us with an unpardonable sin. This act of racial betrayal would set the precedence as the lowest crime in the world. And who told them we did it? White folks. They never got that information from one of us who was there. Such petty thinking was not expected from these so-called eminent men who keep referring to Caucasian's history books as proof. Sometimes they say Africans told them this. But which African? It is usually one that studied at a Caucasian school overseas or one that was locally domesticated like the father of Nelson Mandela. Never! Never have any of them, or anyone else for that matter, ever provided the name of a single king or chief, or ever provided a specific place or time where Africans were traded as slaves before the arrival of those terrorists from Europe. Never. Ask any black man who repeats the story. Ask him where he got it from, and when you follow the trail, it all leads back to the Caucasian. It's like all the Western religious denominations. Regardless of their names, and there are many, all of them lead right back to Rome. Now, let's hear a clip on the subject from one of our real leaders. Let's hear from Dr. Ben what he has to say about Africans trading other Africans. We all know he's an icon in our community. Let's hear from Dr. Ben. But again, I understand. You see, you have been taught by Alex Haley and others that your history started in the slave trade. But they don't even tell you how the slave trade started. They blame you for enslaving yourself. They say your ancestors sold you up. Nice statement. So I asked the guy, what country what was the name of the king? Oh, don't worry about that. They sold you out. As if I don't know that the slave trade started with the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church by the name of Martin V. And Reverend Bartholomew de Las Casas on the island of Hispaniola, now called Haiti and Santo Domingo. You see, you weren't made, you were, nobody told you it's time to get sorry. Because you don't know that the first Africans to be brought in slavery was not taken from Africa, but from Spain and carried to Haiti, then called Hispaniola in 1506, under the aegis of the Pope of the Roman Church and Bartholomew de las Casas. Nothing in your education, because there's nothing in your textbook about any of this so there you have it we just heard from dr ben we know who dr ben is you can listen to the complete video on youtube the series is the black man must wake up and it is video number three he argues with passionate certainty that there is a fatal contradiction when black people are fed a history of themselves based on materials written, controlled, and approved by white folks. His arguments raise the powerful question, would whites or any other group agree to embrace a history of themselves created and controlled by black people? So who are we to believe? Who should we believe? Who must we believe? We have to believe our own people. They are victims too, and they speak on our behalf, those who do. We should not believe those who enslaved us for over 2,000 years, or those who are helping them to sell us this lie. It is said that if someone doesn't treat you right, they will not teach you right either. Now, the question some of our people have is, how could a few criminals overtake the whole continent 
capture millions of Africans and take them away for hundreds of years? It's a good question. They ask about our great empires, our dynasties, our kingdoms and armies. To understand the answer, we have to ask, what defense do birds have against hunters with shotguns when their natural ability to fly is used against them as they move across the open sky? What defense do fishes in the ocean have against fishermen using nets over a mile wide? Sure, the fish can swim, but here again, the very nature of their being has caused them to be in an open environment that is used against them. Abyssinians are very kind and trusting. We were not prepared for this. We had no weapons to speak of. We are a peaceful people by nature, and that peace was used against us by wicked outsiders who had machine guns, who brought their lifestyle of war, destruction, and uh, immorality to our continent. Through the books they gave us, we were led to believe that Columbus and others were just greedy individuals seeking self-riches. What we did not know was that we were actually dealing with multinational companies, corporations, and foreign governments who knighted, financed, armed, and authorized these men. We were up against people who had centuries of experience robbing and killing long before 1492 when Columbus stumbled into the Caribbean. So what kind of weapons were we up against 2,000 years ago. Well, when Julius Caesar decided to challenge Greek power in Africa, they were fighting with spears 10 feet long, metal spears. They had metal shields and vests and riding in chariots that fired hundreds of arrows. They had double-edged swords, flamethrowers, and huge catapults or slingshots on carts that launched massive stones wrapped in cloth that was set on fire. When they came across our villages with a high enclosure, they would launch human bodies that were rotting and filled with worms over the walls. The invaders came with their armies, killed all who resisted and raped our women. They were led by men like King David and King Saul, whose criminal acts of murder, mayhem, and stealing other people's property and territory are well documented in the Bible. What chance do a peaceful people have over these barbarians who love the smell of blood? Caucasians even developed a blood-scented perfume in Europe 2011 and today in 2014 they still eat flesh and they eat it raw. When Kemet, now called Egypt, was made a Roman province in 30 BC, the Romans did not fight Africans to establish that province. The fight was with another Roman. And even some 300 years before that, we were visited by a psychopath from Greece named Alexander. So Europeans with their mighty weapons had control in Abyssinia for centuries. And all during that time, we fought as best as we could to be free from the invader. And today, today we are still fighting the same fight. Things have not changed. Rearranged, yes, but not changed. So long before Christopher Columbus was born, we were being captured and taken to Europe. We didn't know what to expect, but based on what we saw when we got there, it appeared as if we would be working in the capacity as general servants and laborers. However, when some of us were taken to the arenas of Rome and Greece, we saw that the drains of their sport arenas were designed to handle a heavy flow of liquid. We later found out that that liquid was blood. We found out that killing was a sport. Such brutality, such savagery and inhumanity was unheard of in Abyssinia. The trauma of that brutality still linger with us centuries later. This kind of slaughter reveals the twisted minds of Roman citizens who packed these arenas. 
And death in the arena was the biggest show in town, and each bloodletting event lasted for up to 10 minutes. It was truly a vicious, horrifying, and mind-boggling experience for our people who were taken there. Thousands of lions, tigers, elephants, bears, leopards, and many other animals were taken from Africa and brought in to fight against each other. Animals would fight against man, man would fight against man, and even women would fight against women. It was truly a horrible place for civilized people. There were hidden doors with chained animals inside in the fighting area, and during the fight, a doorman would secretly open a door and release one of these animals if a fighter got within 10 feet of that door. Sometimes fighters do not realize how close they are. They are so focused on their opponent and didn't see the gate open and the animal emerging on a 10-foot chain until it was too late. By the end of the day, our blood, guts, and body parts were everywhere. Even today, Caucasians still engage in various blood sports like hockey, wrestling, kickboxing, bullfighting, even non-contact sports like baseball and tennis contains violence. They court danger even in one-person event like motor racing or skydiving, bungee jumping, mountain climbing. Why are Caucasians like that? Why? None of the other three dominant races, namely Chinese, Indians or Abyssinians, surround themselves with death like the Caucasoid race. Death in the arena, it would go on every day for months. Commodus, a Roman emperor, was so stimulated at killing and seeing people getting killed, his matches would last for up to four months. Now, did we just sit back and watch Alexander or Julius Caesar take our animals and our people? No. Did we go with them willingly to fight and die a brutal death in their arenas for hundreds of years? No. Did we give Caligula, another Roman madman emperor, permission to remove the first of many obelisks out of Ethiopia and into Rome in 37 AD? No, we did not. We fought the terrorists at every opportunity and we won many battles. However, However, we were up against a professional group of killers with superior weapons who eventually overran us. For an example of the level of their killing mentality, think about this. Rome. Rome produced the hand grenade 1300 years ago. That is 1300 years ago in the 8th century. We are now in the 21st century. What weapons have they made since then? Based on their own words, Caucasians have enough weaponry to destroy this earth many times over. They even have weapons in space. So how could a fundamentally peaceful and glorious Abyssinian nation win a war against vicious terrorists who possess such weapons and a warlike mentality too much? The French and the British fought a war with explosives for 116 years. It's called the 100 Year War and it ended in 1454, approximately 65 years before the first African was taken to the Caribbean. When Richard Gatlin developed the Gatlin machine gun, it fired 1000 bullets per minute. And when Caucasians saw how deadly this weapon was, Multiple orders came in and this mad white scientist got rich. Each Gatlin was like combining 10 M16s or 10 AK-47s into one gun. So imagine the firepower of 100 or even 1000 Gatlins against Shaka Zulu and our defenders who had only spears and shields made of wood. It was a massacre all over Africa. Now, since we were already captives and servicing Caucasians in lands north of Africa, how did we end up serving them in lands south and southwest of Africa, in the Americas and the Caribbean? To get to the bottom of this, let's look at three events 
in 1492. Now, most of us know that Columbus arrived in the Caribbean in October 1492, but there are two other significant dates in that year that are hardly mentioned. That is January 1st and August the 2nd. On January 1st, 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella became king and queen of Spain. And soon after that, they began implementing Christian policies all over the place. They declared that all non-Christians must convert to Christianity. If not, they should leave Spain. If they do not leave Spain, they will be executed by the state. They were talking predominantly to the Jews who were known as the corrupting entity in Spain. So as soon as the decree was announced, many Jews began leaving. However, some converted and those were called the conversos or the Moranos. But they were only Christians by day. At night, they were Jews again. Some went to Germany, some went to France, Portugal, Russia, and all over Europe, while some decided to wait until the last moment, which was on August the 2nd. Now, the Jews have been in trouble all over Europe many times for the very same thing, which is having a corrupting influence on the society. They were accused of buying government favors, illegally obtaining official offices, bribing officials, loan sharking, prostitution, and other charges in every country they lived in. As a result of those charges and convictions, European Jews were expelled from Rome in 139 BC, from Germany in 1012, from Austria in 1420, Russia 1483, Portugal 1496, and so on and so on. The Jews were even expelled from Martinique in the Caribbean in 1683. But as they got expelled from one country, they would move into another. And as they got expelled, they would move again. Sometimes they got expelled from the same country two or three times. Like France expelled the Jews in 1306 and again in 1322. Holland expelled them in 1276 and again in 1444. So these Jews had a lot of problems in the north from Spain all the way to Turkey. Therefore, their usual route to India and China through that Mediterranean and the Red Sea area was not safe anymore. The other route through the Sahara in North Africa that was filled with their Arab enemies as well. So they, they definitely needed a new route. And in 1487, the Jews and the Portuguese government sent out a pirate named Bartholomew Diaz to find a new route to Asia and to seek out new colonies. So Diaz headed south along the coast of Africa, intending to sail around the southern part of the continent and then head northeast to India and China but he never made it. On his attempt, Diaz made several stops along the African coastline for repairs and supplies. And by the time he got to what is now known as the Cape of Good Hope, which is at the southernmost tip of Africa, he became very sick and a number of his crew was already dead. Thanks to our wonderful mosquitoes. We have to tell, tell those mosquitoes thanks. His ship was also badly in need of repairs, so he decided to return to Portugal and he barely made it back in 1488. Now, let's take a look at these dungeons or supply depot that Diaz visited in his attempt to find China and India. It is very important to note you know, that on Diaz's attempt in 1487, he made a few stops along the African coastline for supplies. His second stop was at the Elmina dungeon on the coast of Ghana, and this dungeon and supply depot was completed in 1482 by the Portuguese. The existence the existence of this dungeon slash repair center slash supply depot 
prove that Portugal and their Jewish financiers were already in the business of kidnapping Africans from West Africa approximately 10 years before Columbus first stumbled into the Caribbean and about 35 years before the first African was even brought there. When you see these dungeons up close, you know that this required a huge amount of work and a huge amount of capital. The dungeons are made from metal and stones and built to last. They have been lasting for over 500 years. They are built right in the sea and so far they are free from water damage. They are built so strong that even today some West African countries use a few as prisons and others use them as museums. This means that by today's standard, today's security standard, those dungeons are still a very, very secure place. The walls are four feet thick and each cell is about 20 feet squared with a metal plate about 12 inches wide embedded in the wall about three feet from the floor and running on all four walls all around the cell. There is also a huge metal ring rising from the center of the floor or the center of the cell. So imagine our ancestors sitting on the floor with their backs to the wall and looking at the big metal ring in front of them in the center of the cell. Chains were then placed around their necks and connected to the metal plate embedded in the wall behind them. Another chain was placed on their feet and shackled to the big metal ring in the center of the cell. These are the kinds of brutal, inhuman acts of Caucasians. These are their acts that they want to saddle us with. It was truly a horrible place and this shows the kinds of people we were dealing with. So how could anyone, especially one of us, believe the words of someone who would do these things to another person? It's obvious Caucasians had every intention to continue this wicked act forever. The structures even have additional torture and condemned cells. It was truly a place of torment. Above the cells were the living quarters offices and even a church so while the slavers were upstairs praying they could feel the moans groans and the cries of our people vibrating through the stones underneath it was okay for the slavers because their god would always forgive them and that's why their favorite song is amazing grace it was written by john newton a terrorist captain of one of those torture ships he knew he was truly the wretched of the earth. He knew why he called himself a wretch. So, because of their bad reputation, the Jews had to find a new route to India and China. And their first attempt, working with the Portuguese, using the pirate Bartholomew Diaz in 1487, that failed miserably. So, when Ferdinand and Isabella came to power in 1492 and made their declaration that the Jews had to leave town, they knew they had no choice but to try again if they wanted to stay in business while living in some other country. Now, the second important date in 1492 was August the 2nd. And this was the last day for the Jews to convert, leave town, or die. Some fled to various countries and modified their names but still kept links with those who converted and stayed in Spain. And it was this group, the Moranos, who decided to use Columbus in their attempt to find the new route to India and China. It was hoped that he would succeed where Diaz had failed. The Spanish monarchy, who was also involved, saw this as an opportunity to spread Christianity and to seek out new sources of colonial wealth. Now, the third significant date in 1492 was October when Columbus left Spain. But soon after, because he was in unfamiliar territory, he was unaware of the big annual breeze, 
Caucasians call it the monsoon breeze or the monsoon winds and at that time of year it blows westerly and then a few months later it blows in the opposite direction so those in the know would use these powerful winds to move around the African coastline and beyond Obviously, Columbus was not in the know, so instead of going south, he was blown off course in a westerly direction and ended up in the Bahamas consisting of over 30 islands. Columbus was lost. He did not know where he was. Fortunately for him and his crew, his ships were seen by local people who decided to investigate. When they boarded the ships in early December, they found a confused Columbus and crew. But being a people of morals, they took them ashore, fed and watered them until they revived. But when he came to his senses, Columbus thought he had reached the west side of India because the people around him looked like those in India. They explained to him where he was because they had traveled the area using those same monsoon winds and as soon as he was well again, he became his old mean self, turning on the Indians, putting them to work on agricultural plantations. Because of the people he saw, Columbus called the area the West Indies and wrote in his diary that the natives had no weapons and he saw them with gold and other shiny trinkets. Now, remember, Columbus was lost, so he was still looking for the route to China and to India, and he decided to move around the area. He stumbled across Cuba and Haiti in December of 1492, and did the very same thing to the local populations. In 1493 now, he returned to Spain, and he had with him 200 captives from the Caribbean, leaving his brother in charge of the new colonies. Isabella and Ferdinand was very happy and they wanted sovereignty over all the islands so they petitioned Pope Alexander VI who granted them exclusive title in the papal order of 1493 to do as they please. Columbus financiers in Spain and Portugal, they now had two business ventures going on. They were selling us in Europe, and because Columbus stumbled into the Caribbean, they eventually planted sugarcane for sugar, but mostly for alcohol. Europeans are strongly addicted to alcohol. So the existing trade of taking Africans from the west coast of Africa, northwest to the Canary and the Bisagos Islands, then into Spain, Portugal and other places in Europe was doing well. The new island colonies making up the Bahamas were filled with the Indians producing tobacco and spices, while Cuba and Haiti was covered with sugarcane plantations. Life was good for the investors from 1493 until the early 1500s. But by 1515, the labor force began dwindling. Many natives died from overwork. Others were killed because they refused to work. Soon, none remained in working order, and by 1518, a replacement labor force was needed. We already know that Portugal had a dungeon in Ghana as early as 1482 that stored Africans before taking them We already know that Portugal had a dungeon in Ghana as early as 1482 that stored Africans before taking them to the Canary and the Bisagos Islands. So around 36 years later in 1518, when Africans were first transported to the West and the Caribbean, Africa was already a conquered place where none of us was safe. None of us. Each dungeon was protected by a watchtower. Some even had a fort. The tower is a huge circular building about the size of a football stadium, approximately 10 stories high. It had gun portholes every six feet all the way around from top to bottom with cannons encircling the top. 
It's located about 200 yards from the dungeon and strategically positioned between the dungeon and the space leading to the dungeon. The entire area is cleared of trees for about two miles with patrols all along the perimeter. So any attempt to rescue our people was always futile. The clear empty landscape would provide no cover, not even at night due to the bright African moonlight and the Gatlin machine guns, they were always ready and waiting. Many of us barely escaped during some of our rescue attempts. So this new route into the Caribbean by these European terrorists was simply an expansion of their existing business. They were already carrying our people up the west coast of Africa. We were already being taken by force and those who hunted and captured us were heavily harmed Caucasians. Professor Walter Rodney from Guyana concludes in his book how Europe underdeveloped Africa. He said that we did no such wicked deeds to our people. It was all done, all the capturing, all the hunting, all of this was done by Europeans. Now, let's look at this from a biblical perspective. It must be understood that the creator of earth did not write the Bible. Regardless of what anyone says, God did not write the Bible, even though some people would like you to believe that. The author of many books, many books of the Old Testament is unknown. What, but we also know but we do know that the Greeks wrote some of the New Testament. And most Greek religious symbols, among other things, are actually modified images stolen from Kemet or Egypt by Homer, Herodotus, Alexander, in collaboration with other criminals from Rome and Greece. Now, having said that, the Bible clearly defines what slavery was like during the period and it is also very clear about those who hunt and kidnap people. They are called man stealers. During the Bible period a person is usually enslaved due to an unpaid debt. Subsequently the Bible put words like servant, helper, slave, debtor and maid together saying slaves can own property that slavery was for a specific period of time and that the children of slaves were not slaves themselves. Proverbs 29 verse 21, Second Samuel 9 verse 10, etc. explains how a person classified as a slave was treated in biblical times. Now, the Bible was around in the 1500s, so those who profess Christianity but was still kidnapping us surely knew the difference they had the book they knew that what they were doing was wrong according to the teachings of their book so even though they call it slavery because of some similarities the bible makes it very clear that slavery and man stealing are two different things that one was legal and the other was not exodus 21 verse 16 Deuteronomy 24 verse 7 1 Timothy 9 and 10 and other places speak against these acts saying they are punishable by death. Now since we did not owe the invader anything we were under no obligation to work for him none whatsoever but to convince us the slave monster would sometimes set us on fire this way others would not follow our example and refuse to work or even to run away. However, he preferred to administer many lashes. Killing us meant he would lose his investment and that of, and that of our offsprings, especially if you were a woman. At times though, he would chop off our toes. Caucasians, backed up by their weapons of mass destruction, had Africa under lock and key and could do as they pleased with us long before Columbus was born. They did not need any help from us. They wanted all of us. You do what they say or they would kill you and your family before moving to the next person with the same 
position with the same desire with the same request you obey or you die did that leave us with any long-lasting trauma well let's look at some of the psychological trauma doctors expect American soldier Bo Birdall to experience Birdall was held by the Taliban in Afghanistan for only five years Keep in mind, Birdall was on a kill and destroy mission thousands of miles away from his home when he was captured. We were innocent. We were at home when we were captured. So what effect will it have on us? Birdall's activities in captivity was sleeping, eating and exercising. He did no labor. If his condition is so grave as we will soon hear after such a short time and with no abuse one cannot imagine or even measure our condition after generations of captivity with both physical and mental abuse attached our trauma is impossible to calculate our trauma is impossible to measure let's listen to the possible mental condition of Bo Birdall after only five years of straight captivity you know when you look at this and you were saying something earlier this week that really stood out to me you said even though he will come home not missing a limb you have to look at it and and look beyond that not being gone because so much of him has been taken the emotional trauma the mental trauma. Talk to us about that because I think for so many people they may see him and it may look like the Bo Bergdahl they knew. Well and that's the classic way I try to describe post-traumatic stress issues is that uh, most of it is psychological if it's not physical you can't see it mm -hmm. and many times over the years from any war deployment when people come back with emotional scars you don't see those scars and you have to read through that so you know he's been through five years of trauma regardless of what happened how it went down right. But he's going to have a new awakening and a different kind of trauma, even getting back to his family because it's such a different scenario than he's been used to. And there's an acclimation time, a debriefing time. And, and that process just takes a period of time and everyone is different on how they yeah. matriculate through that process. I did want to talk to you a lot about that acclimation because, um, you know, in, in terms of that reuniting with their family that is not the first step at all this i think is what officials call the third step in this long process but a lot of times Correct. when someone who has uh, has been in a, in, a, in a terrifying scenario like this they can only really reunite with their family at first for a moment of minutes it is it is that overwhelming well you have to look at it like exposure overload you know i mean he's going through a step down process to make sure medically that he's okay nutritionally as a part of that he's okay psychologically that he's okay but there's nothing like seeing a family member or something familiar to him from five years past or eight years past whatever it really was total that will bring on a whole set of emotions a, a different set of reaction and you've got to take that in baby steps because that itself can be very very overwhelming and can actually put him back into right. a bad situation that he doesn't want to go to and, and medical people don't want him to go to either and, you know, we've been told by a senior U.S. official that, indeed, um, he is in, a, in, in well enough health that he could talk to his family on the phone from the hospital there in Germany. They could actually go there to meet with him in person. As far as we know, that hasn't happened yet. He hasn't talked to them on the phone, mm -hmm. hasn't seen them there. Does that surprise you? Or is this going to be a matter of weeks before he's potentially ready to be reunited with his family? Maybe not until he's back here in the United States. Well, first of all, it doesn't surprise me because everyone... As everyone grieves differently, everyone transitions differently, and it's not uncommon. I do a lot of this. I hear a lot of stories and help these individuals acclimate back to society. Right. And you've really got to meet them where they are. Regardless of the situation, you've got to really take it slowly. And whether it's a phone conversation or a brief, you know, in-person, you know, meeting with his family, everyone is going to have to weigh in on that and make sure it's the safest thing for him and his recovery process that's going to take him the rest of his life. Yeah, we appreciate the expertise. Of course, no one knows. Really, he's the only one that has these answers, but you have been around people in this situation before and have seen what it is like for them to go through it. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming in for us, Terry. You're welcome. Thank you. So, there you have it. Caucasian experts say some psychological effects after five years of just straight captivity 
meaning no work was required from him and he wasn't beaten or abused, after five years of that kind of captivity, he could develop difficulty eating, sleeping, using the bathroom, loss of his vocal cords, loss of his accent, forgetting his own language. He suffering from all of this and he wasn't even required to work a day in the hot Afghanistan sun among other abuses we suffered for over 500 years. Burdar was a US soldier fighting in Afghanistan. If he can be so afflicted after just five years, considering he was the aggressor, he got caught behind enemy lines. Imagine the mental state of someone who was innocently captured at his home while sitting under a tree with his family then held for 500 years, underfed, overworked and beaten periodically. What is the effect on an individual like that? In closing, we must say to those who say we were complicit that yes, we were complicit. We certainly were involved but only in the capacity of the victim. We were never involved at any stage in the selling of ourselves. That word was not in our vocabulary. We knew the white man was pure evil. We knew he was taking our people to hell. What do you think he was doing to us before we built those warehouse dungeons? You think he built them and then enslaved us? No. The dungeons was an expansion. It's like adding a drive through section to an existing business. Remember, we were already enslaved since the days of Julius Caesar. Check the history of Rome and you will see us as servants, singing, dancing, fighting and dying for over 2,000 years. In the year 306, that is 1,708 years ago, another Roman emperor, Constantine, he began increasing European control over the mind of our babies using a newly minted version of our spirituality backed up by his sword. So to answer the question, when was the trial of our ancestors conducted and under whose jurisdiction? Who prepared the charges? Where is the evidence? Who are the witnesses? And who was the judge that found us guilty of aiding and abetting the enemy? How can our so-called leaders publicly relay this low-down racial information about us with a clear conscience? Why are they doing this? There must be a reason. How can we agree with the conviction of our ancestors? How can we disrespect them by believing they would commit the dreadful crime of destroying their families and destroying their culture, especially, especially when this low-down charge is made by none other than the invader himself, who we know has a vested interest in the outcome of this matter? Our ancestors deserve some respect around here. They are not here to defend themselves, but we are here, and we must defend them because they are innocent of all charges. Columbus did not go into Africa with a few criminals and dominated the continent in 1492. By then, it was already conquered and no African was safe. We were never a part of their wicked conspiracy. Europeans are the only ones responsible. They were the invaders, they were the occupiers, they were the ones in charge, they had all the power, and they took all the benefits. Today, however, they're losing that power, and their ill-gotten gains are fast disappearing. The economic state of Europe and North America in this 21st century is failing fast because the African gravy chain is no more. They cannot rob Africa as they used to, so they cannot afford to pay reparations and only a little is left from what they stole. So with the continuous and growing demand for reparations and possible charges of genocide, the only way for Caucasians to save themselves is to get their victims to share the blame of what happened to them. They want their victims to take partial responsibility for their own enslavement. That is insane. 
and we are not. That expectation concealed within the idea that Abyssinians will forever share the blame for what Caucasians did by themselves is abnormal, especially since the story is false. Caucasians cannot fool all of us all the time. We must be fair to our ancestors. We were not there, so we can't just convict them of such a low-down charge after hearing only one side of the story. And who are we hearing it from? We're hearing it from people who we know are thieves, terrorists, and psychopaths. We will never believe this bunch. Look at their resume. They are not qualified. They have robbed and killed too many people all over the world for too long. Look how loving and forgiving the people of Rwanda are today. The deadly brainwashing they received a few years ago from Europe and America has worn off and they are back to their good old Abyssinian self again. Based on how they are today and how they were 100 years ago, it's clear they were not in their right minds a few years ago. They were obviously under a mass mind control program administered by Europe. So, let's go by what we know, not by the story Caucasians are telling us. We should think about the situation. Until records, sales records made by us is produced, showing our sales and purchases before the arrival of the invader, we must not believe this terrorist. Any records produced after he came are his records, not ours. The absence of evidence means the evidence is absent. We know he's a terrorist. We know he's a terrorist. We know he invaded our land and the lands of many others, killed millions of people and stole our things. How then can we believe someone who is of such bad character? We never sold each other to Caucasians in Abyssinia and there is no evidence to support this one-sided story. What we do know is that two parties were involved in a relationship. One of the involved parties came out rich and the other is in a coma. The one who came out rich is blaming the one in the coma of being in that state because he was committing suicide or he was attempting to commit suicide. This makes no sense whatsoever because we know Abyssinians are not suicidal. We also know that he did not authorize Caucasian man to speak on his behalf. So to be very clear. All available records on the business of buying and selling people in Africa are all written in a European language. They were made by those terrorists who operated various human warehouse dungeons along the western coastline of Abyssinia. All of them. And again, to be very clear, there are no records anywhere written in our language, in any Abyssinian language, that details the sale or purchase of anyone anywhere in Africa before the arrival of those same terrorists from Europe. And we have records about everything. We did not sell our people, and let us make that clear. Asher.